Good morning. I'm Joe Collins and welcome to See Me Church Online. Our mission at this church is to love God and neighbor one household at a time. We're a group of ordinary people who believe in the extraordinary message of Jesus Christ. So no matter who you are or what your story, we're just glad you're here. As always, I want to encourage you to participate in our time together by leaving your feedback online in the comments section below or in the chat window on the side. I'd also like to remind you to keep in touch with each other this week and with your Oikos. You can do this by connecting online or in person at your discretion. And by the way, don't forget to share the link to our YouTube channel so that others can join us on Sundays. As you can see, I'm in my backyard and that's one of the perks of a stay-at-home order, I guess. But we've been in a series uh, for the past couple weeks entitled One-on-One -on -one with Jesus. The idea is to look at him through a new lens and by doing so, gain a fresh perspective on his teaching and practice. Last week, we examined a one-on-one -on -one between Jesus and the devil, and we were reminded to depend on him, to honor him, and to trust in God. Today, I wanna look at another intriguing one-on-one -on -one between Jesus and someone in the crowd. As always, the goal is to draw out something relevant to our faith and life today. So I've been watching more news than I normally watch, especially the nightly news, and specifically the president's nightly coronavirus briefings. Now, whether you love them or hate them, one thing about these briefings that I've noticed is that the press corps loves to heckle them. They love to shout out questions and demand answers. Well, today we're gonna to look at an interaction between Jesus and an unknown person in the crowd who heckled him in the midst of some very important teaching between himself and his disciples. The guy shouted out his request and demanded an answer. We're gonna start by turning to Luke chapter 11, but let's pray first. Father, thank you for this time to be together. We pray for your spirit to be with us. Speak through me as I speak to the church this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Luke chapter 11. When Jesus had finished speaking, verse 37, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table, but the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You know, the rift between Jesus and the Pharisees has been growing for some time, and now it has reached a new level. In Luke 11, Jesus is invited to dine by a Pharisee who becomes critical of him for not washing his hands before the meal. At the time, religious sects like the Pharisees made a big deal out of washing hands before eating, but not because they were dirty, but because in the course of their day, they might have become dirty by inadvertently touching someone who they considered unclean, which is in the case of the Pharisees was pretty much everybody. In response, Jesus called the Pharisee dirty and accused him and others like him of greed and wickedness. You know, it's no surprise that there was increasing animosity between Jesus and the Pharisees and why he wasn't invited to many more of their dinner parties after this. Chapter 12, verse one. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You know, the Pharisees may not have enjoyed Jesus's company, but the people sure loved him. And in Luke 12, we see Jesus speaking to his disciples, but a crowd of many thousands has gathered to listen in. Well, he tells his disciples to be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. Later on in the same interaction, in verses four and five, he encourages his disciples to fear God, not the Pharisees. And finally, in verse eight, he tells them to stand up to people like them. In effect, Jesus is openly calling for revival by telling his disciples and those listening to reject the hyper-religiosity of the Pharisees, which is really just hypocrisy of looking good on the outside, but on the inside of being just as dirty and sinful as the people that they washed their hands of before every meal. Jesus was looking for a revival, but a revival of the heart. You know, last week, if there's one thing that really, I said that if there was one thing that really chaps God's hide, it's people who, doesn't, who doubt his promises. You know, I'm going to say to you this week that if there's another thing that chaps his hide, it's hypocrisy, especially among believers. You know, the Pharisees were believers, but they were also very proud of being Pharisees and of their rigorous adherence to religious ritual. You know, that's all fine and good, but where they ran afoul of Jesus is, where they, is when they overlooked the sin of their own hearts, like greed, among other things. 
Brothers and sisters, we cannot fall into the same trap that the Pharisees did by outwardly doing religious things, but coveting sin in our hearts. Our faith needs to be genuine and needs to be devoid of hypocrisy. You know, this is some pretty heavy stuff. And you can imagine the disciples and the crowds listening intently to, and focused on every word that falls from Jesus' mouth. Then all of a sudden, someone in the crowd blurts out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. You know, in the midst of this pretty intense teaching against the Pharisees and their hypocrisy, someone, a total stranger in the crowd, suddenly blurts out and demands that Jesus settle a dispute between himself and his brother over their inheritance. Talk about situational, situational awareness. I mean, this guy had none of that. Not unlike some of the reporters at the president's press briefings. Now, I can't say that this was totally uncalled for because it was common for rabbis in that day to mediate matters like this between families. But it certainly was totally out of place. Besides, Jewish law was very clear on this matter. The eldest son was given double the inheritance and control of this state. So if there were four children, three would receive 20% each while the eldest would receive 40% and was the one who decided what happened or how it was divided up to the, each sibling. He could decide to pay it out all in one lump sum, give each sibling their share and wash his hands and be done of it. Or he could also decide to keep the inheritance intact, intact and make payments to himself and his siblings, kind of like how a trust might work today. Obviously the guy who shouted at Jesus from the crowd was not the eldest son, and he had disagreed for some time with his brother's handling of their father's estate. And not able to hold it in any longer, he blurred out his demand for mediation, and in doing so, revealed something about the condition of his own heart. He was greedy. He wanted all his money, and he wanted it all for himself. Clearly, this guy had an unhealthy relationship with money, and with his family for that matter. Annoyed by this guy's lack of situational awareness, Jesus refuses to mediate for him. But at the same time, he's concerned for him. And so he warns him, like he did the Pharisee at dinner, about the dangers of greed and the emptiness that comes with it. You know, it's not often that I talk about greed, and it's not because I don't think it's wrong or relevant. It's because like other sins of the heart, it varies in degrees and from person to person. And it's awfully hard to identify and root out, but not for Jesus. He sees what's in your heart. And that includes me and you and certainly this guy. So if you're struggling with greed or any other sin of the heart, ask Jesus to make it obvious to you and help you root it out. And I promise he will. He certainly did for this guy. And this guy didn't even ask. In verse 16, Jesus goes on and he tells him a parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my bars and build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. You know, we could easily argue that the rich man in this parable is actually wise and responsible person. His farm had produced more grain than he could store, and so he decided to build bigger barns to store the excess. Then he relaxed and started to enjoy life and not worried about his future. Does that sound bad to you? I mean, after all, aren't we supposed to work hard and save for our retirement? Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes, we're supposed to be responsible and save for our retirement, but no, not at the expense of our relationships with God and neighbor. If you didn't notice it before, whenever the rich man talks in this parable, he talks only to himself and refers only to himself. He never expresses any gratitude to God or anyone else for that matter. 
And even though he has enough grain to last a lifetime, there's no mention of him sharing it with anyone. You see, the rich farmer is a fool in God's eyes, not because he's wealthy or because he's saved for the future, but because he lived for himself. He was greedy. Kind of like the younger brother who wanted his inheritance all to himself. You know, I know in the midst of this economic turmoil, in the wake of COVID-19, things have gotten quite distressing. Like you, I've been watching the value of my net worth fluctuate wildly and doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. You know, it's in times like these that I need to be reminded that there's more to my life than my bank account and that I need to prioritize people over possessions and God over all. You know, recently a friend of mine shared a post on Facebook. I don't know where it came from, but I really enjoyed reading it because I think the message of the post is very consistent with what we're talking about today, about the need for cleansing our heart, our, our hearts of the, of the sin that can get, of, of heart sin and about rooting them out, about repenting, and about reviving ourselves. I'd like to share it with you now. In three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you wanna worship athletes? I will shut down the stadiums. You wanna worship musicians? I will shut down the civic centers. You wanna worship actors? I will shut down the theaters. You wanna worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I will make it where you can't go to church. And then he quotes scripture. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive them their sin and heal their land. Maybe we need to take this time of isolation from the distraction of the world and have a personal revival where we focus on the only thing in the world that really matters, Jesus. You know, I'm not taking credit for this whole coronavirus thing, but I have to admit that since the beginning of the year, I have been praying, not for our country, but for our entire culture to experience revival. Maybe God's been praying the same thing. If there's anything we can learn from this one-on-one between Jesus and this guy in the crowd and the current experience that we're all going through, it's that we need revival. And as I said before, revival starts in the heart. So repent of your heart's sin, greed, and other things. And humble yourself, pray for forgiveness, and seek his face. You know, I want to close our time this morning by simply reading three brief but powerful vignettes that Jesus told to his disciples, to the crowd, and by extension us, and certainly to the guy who shouted out to him. And all three illustrate what he meant when he said to that guy, Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Afterwards, I'm gonna invite you to spend two minutes in prayer reflecting on the lesson. Then I'll say a prayer of my own and we'll be done for today. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. For is life more than food and the body more than clothes? Consider the ravens, they do not sow or weep, reap, They have no storerooms or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Did I tell you not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these? If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You have little faith, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'd like to encourage you now to take a couple minutes and go to God, your Father, in prayer.
Father, I want to thank you for the message today, for the reminder that the sin that gets in our heart is the sin that we've got to root out the most. And when we do, revival follows. And I pray for that revival now. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, at See Me Church, we believe the Bible is the best source of truth in our world today. In it, we learn that Jesus is Lord, that he lived a sinless life, and died on a cross, and rose to life again. It is in this belief that we do everything. We are a member-supported fellowship by people like me. You can give today online at seemechurch.org or by texting keyword seemechurch to 77977. I want to encourage you to take communion sometime today and remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lastly, I want Seemi Church to be your church, your family's church, and your neighbor's church. <coughs> if you'd like to know more, please message me through YouTube or our website, seemechurch.org. If you're not ready to do that, that's okay. Just keep coming back. You can find us here every Sunday in person or at our building as soon as we get the all clear. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you next Sunday. God bless. Been holding on for too long Singing the same, those the same songs Putting me behind the misery It's all for me been holding on for too long But now I've got nothing to hold on It all just sounds like Ooh.